Ladies, gentlemen, and every magnificent thing between and outside, this is the Envoy of Kairos, back for more of the Mesopus region. So, this will be a shorter, more conceptual video, having less to do with the Pokémon themselves and more about your own characters. Pokémon has gotten deeper and deeper into character creation in recent games, although the limited outfits in Scarlet and Violet were a disappointment. But regardless, it's a facet I want to include and expand upon in Mesopus. If this were somehow to become a fan game, I'd want it to have a wider option for character creation. Not just skin tones, hair, eyes, and makeup. No, my intention is even organizing the details of their region of origin, if they're not a local, as well as their starting age range from 12 to 18, in order to cover the whole gambit of ages that our player characters have been so far, and even have a system for organically aging your characters throughout the game. This would also mean having time for the world to change and grow as your characters progress, and giving time for the villain's plan to develop in a wider time frame, going from being a small underground threat to the potentially world-ending problem they can become, in the span of not months at best like the canon series, but years. Depending on the age you choose for your characters, you then get to choose a certain level of experience in a set of five overworld skills for your trainer to develop. The older the character, the more time they've had to develop a skill, even multiple skills if you so choose. But if you start off at the youngest age, they're a blank slate, but with a bonus to developing these skills faster than a matured character. The skills in question are foraging, crafting, medicine, cooking, and mining. They're pretty self-explanatory. Foraging will of course give you better and more plentiful resources from the land. Crafting will allow you to make better items from those resources, and eventually with enough efficiency to double your yield. For some items, anyway. Medicine will make it easier to treat your Pokémon's conditions and injuries, making potions more effective and possibly healing your party's status effects without spending any items to do so. Cooking then gives you access to a similar system to Scarlet and Violet's sandwiches and the buffs they provide, but a wider range of dishes. My intention is to be able to make a full course meal, but with different entrees and sides of certain types representing all effects associated with a particular type, but then the additional ingredients would determine what it does about that type. For example, if you wanted to increase the shiny rate for electric types, you might want to make a sour dessert. Still workshopping that, it'd be pretty complex. Lastly, there's the mining skill, marking the return of every Pokémon player's old favorite minigame, Mining from Generation 4. This skill will let you find rarer items more easily, spot more mining points, and tell what kind of value is hidden in them, take longer to collapse walls when in the process of actually mining, and even get a free spot or two containing an item pointed out when you start. How you develop these skills is twofold. Experience from just doing them a lot, and lessons from people experienced in those fields. Roshan might give you a very valuable lesson in mining, and give you an experience boost early into the game. Or you could go to this region's version of Dubai, which I've dubbed Tahab, and if you have a high enough level in cooking, a five-star chef might notice you and give you a few lessons as well. Keep an eye out for potential teachers. Some may give you free lessons, others will make you pay for them, but their advice is invaluable. Now, the skill system may seem like a lot, but there's one other addition to mental character development I've tucked into this conceptual game. If you're playing two trainers at once, the relationship between them is a critical part of how they're going to advance as a team, and your decisions will determine that relationship's depth and function. Much like the teaching events in the skill system, there will be countless social events scattered around the world with various ways to interact with them that will determine how your character's relationship will grow. You can choose various points to start their relationship at as well for older characters, but it's all based on a two-axis system. The most critical axis is the base friendship stat. Getting involved in these social events at all will increase it in some way, with variation based on your choices, either making it less effective or funneling some of that experience into one of the two directions on the other axis. The two directions your bond can sway are rivalry and romance. It's possible to develop both, but you can't fully develop both, only one fully and one partially. Each of these has its own function to how it affects your trainers in battle and outside it. 
The friendship meter's progress will give you access to new dialogue options, but in battle, it also gives you access to a higher frequency of bond actions. These work like the affection system in canon Pokémon games, but will be far less abusable in their results. Your Pokémon could share the effects of held items when a partner needs them more, particularly healing or defensive berries. Your Pokémon could get a buff based on their battle partner's best stat at random. At higher levels, you can unlock the chance for them to take hits for each other to mitigate super effective damage. The romance and rivalry stats don't increase frequency, but they do add to the pool of potential bond actions. Rivals will get competitive about skill development and earn experience in the same field faster as they compete with each other. In battle, they unlock abilities such as one Pokémon responding to an ally's buff with one of their own for free, shaking off binding and trapping moves, and recursive critical hits as one Pokémon refuses to fall behind the other in damage output. Romantic partners will passively earn experience in skills their partner is developing, while still being able to specialize in their own skills of choice. In battle, they can heal each other's status effects, recover a bit of health when using buff or charge moves, and respond to their partner receiving a crit with a sharp stat buff to their best attack stat. As I said before, developing these relationship stats is based on social events scattered around the world. For example, you get involved in a carnival at Behenge de Shad's Balloon Festival, and choose to play some of the games. You could just play a bunch of them and have a blast, focusing on the friendship stat. But you could also play a lot of them competitively, trying to one-up each other as you develop a rivalry. Or you could have them go out of their ways to win more prizes for each other, developing a romantic relationship. Any choice is viable, but you'll find more options opening up as your characters age and explore more of the region. Whatever choices you make, your two trainers will become inseparable allies in the long war to conquer the League of the Mesopus region, and eventually, uncover and topple the great conspiracy threatening to overrun it. But hey, that's enough for that for now. There's two new mechanics down, and next time, we'll be getting into one of the remaining two with the most complex animation I've ever done, so that's going to be interesting. I hope you're looking forward to a more high-octane video next time. For now, this is the Envoy of Cairo signing out. Remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share this around to any big Pokémon fans you know. Thanks for watching, guys.